My name is Carl Steinbach. Um, I'm an engineer at Citus Data. Uh, I'm also, uh, let's see, a member of the PMC and a committer on the Apache Hive project, which is uh, kind of like a database project related to Hadoop. Um, and uh, in the past, I've worked at a bunch of uh, enterprise software companies, most recently Cloudera, where I was a uh, team lead for the uh, Hive team. Um, I've also spent time at Informatica, uh, NetApp, where I worked on storage security products. Uh, and Oracle, where I sort of started my uh, you know, professional career working on the database server. Um, my other sort of claim to fame is that I wrote that blog post about Tom Lane's email habits, which I think uh, a lot of you have probably read. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, hopefully this presentation lives up to that blog post. Um, anyway, uh, I've given uh, talks on this topic a couple times in the past. Uh, and from those experiences, I've learned that it's a good idea to sort of start up front uh, by making sure that we're all on the same page about what a distributed analytic database is. Um, I think you know, probably 95% of people, when you say relational database, they automatically think OLTP, you know, the standard sort of uh, you know, create, update, delete uh, use case scenario with uh, transactions. And an analytic database is definitely not uh, OLTP. It's, uh, you know, typically uh, referred to as an OLAP database. So uh, the kind of things that you're going to do with an OLAP database uh, include um, you know, processing, let's say, clickstream events, or processing log files, or processing some kind of uh, uh, event or fact type data. Um, and typically, uh, people are going to do uh, aggregations uh, on those data or, or big joins. Um, but in terms of you know, the way that the actual sort of like database behaves, uh, one thing that sort of defines OLAP use cases uh, is large sequential scans, where typically you're looking at the entire uh, table as part of a query. Um, another thing is they're not really transaction oriented. So uh, a lot of the stuff that you see in OLTP databases don't really apply. And then I think finally, and this is probably most important to the rest of this presentation, uh, in terms of the performance characteristics of OLAP databases, uh, they are typically I.O. bound. So if you're looking for sort of the performance bottleneck in the system, it's not going to be the CPU. It's typically going to be the rate at which uh, the database process can actually pull information off of disk. Um, so a lot of work uh, you know, over the past 10 or 20 years has gone into like figuring out uh, how to uh, reduce the impact of that bottleneck or eliminate it altogether. So uh, you know, one thing that... Uh, also you know, relates to, to what we're going to discuss is uh, the enterprise storage model. And uh, this is you know, something that's evolved over, let's say, the past 20 or 30 years. And uh, the goal of this uh, is to basically solve the problem of availability and accessibility for data in the context of, let's say, a large enterprise, you know, a company with 10, 100, 1,000 employees, and terabytes and possibly even petabytes of data. So obviously, you know, that data is not going to sit on one computer. It's going to sit on a bunch of computers. And you want somehow to make it accessible to uh, a large number of people in your organization. So you need to be able to uh, access it over a network of some sort. Um, and you know, the, the sort of solution that's evolved to this over time, and, and really that uh, a whole industry has been built around, um, is basically structuring your data centers such that you have uh, a pool of storage. And this could be in the form of a, a NAS or a SAN. Uh, and then it's connected uh, via some kind of switching you know, network fabric to a pool of uh, uh, compute you know, resources. Um, so there are a couple problems with this. Uh, one problem that uh, customers feel immediately is cost. This is a really expensive solution. This is a lot more expensive than going out and buying a hard drive at Fry's Electronics or Best Buy or something like that. I mean, you're talking about spending a thousand or upwards of a thousand dollars per terabyte, probably you know even more uh, conventionally. Um, and then uh, add to that the fact that uh, uh, these systems um, have sort of a built-in scalability problem, and the scalability problem is that really big pipe that sits between your island of you know compute resources and your island. Of, uh, of storage resources. So as you attempt to scale out your storage pool, you're going to have to make that pipe bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, and um, in practice, I mean, there are sort of limits to how big you can make that pipe. Um, there are also limits to how, uh, you know, consequently, how much you can scale sort of the underlying storage tier. And what happens 
as a consequence is that people tend to sort of partition uh, these resources, which means they'll end up with multiple uh, islands of, of storage pools and multiple uh, islands of um, you know, compute workers. And then that adds, uh, on top of it, an additional manageability problem. And there's sort of a whole industry that's, that's uh, grown around just solving that, the, uh, you know, helping you to shuttle data from uh, one storage pool to another to meet uh, SLAs or, or jobs that um, you have running in the background. Um, I also want to say that this diagram is sort of a, a gross you know, oversimplification. I'm trying to get the, the main points home. But I wanted to point out that uh, you know, in, besides just having like a storage pool, there are actually, in a sense, multiple different um, tiers of storage pool with different sort of price performance characteristics. Uh, so oftentimes, in the uh, compute pool, you might have uh, an OLAP database. And that database will have its own sort of private storage pool, uh, which will often be, in terms of you know, cost per terabyte, much more expensive than sort of your larger pool of online storage. And consequently, you fall into this uh, you know, usage pattern where you're always sort of moving data uh, between these two pools. Because you can't fit all of the stuff that you want to look at in the sort of fast, uh, small pool of storage. Um, and you know, as a result, like, there are pretty big uh, management headaches. So um, you know, over 10 years ago at this point, uh, the folks at Google uh, were building you know, this gigantic search engine. And in order to uh, build the inverted index that they needed to power that search engine, they were collecting these gigantic data sets by doing web crawls. Um, and I think you know, they realized pretty early on uh, that if they got uh, hooked on sort of the NAS or, or SAN solution, uh, that that would not be just a bottleneck for their data center, but it would really be a bottleneck for their business. Um, so they, they knew that they had to find uh, a, different, a different solution to that problem. Um, and they knew that uh, you know, whatever solution they ended up with, it had to both be uh, inexpensive uh, and it had to be uh, very scalable. So the sort of design priorities that they set out were, first off, uh, we're going to base this on commodity hardware. Um, we want the, the hardware that the system is built on top of to be as inexpensive as possible. And sort of a consequence of that is, when you go with you know, inexpensive commodity hardware, you expect the stuff to fail all the time. And if you're deploying 1,000 of these boxes, you expect probably one box to fail every day, if not multiple boxes. So you have to have uh, you know, a system that can uh, be resilient in the face of these constant uh, failures and outages. So another really, I think, interesting thing about this is that uh, the solution that they came up with, of course, is referred to as the Google file system. But in many ways, it's not really a conventional file system. Uh, it's more of, let's say, a distributed block store. And uh, there's some sort of interesting, uh, there's an interview online that you can find uh, with Sean Quinlan, who was one of the original architects of this system. And he sort of talks about uh, you know, the, the genesis of how they, they came up with this sort of set of priorities and the things that they decided were uh, not so important. And I think one of the really critical things is that uh, they weren't worried about supporting or building a POSIX file system. They weren't worried about supporting random reads or random writes. So there was a lot of stuff, a lot of sort of like file system dogma that they just dispensed with very quickly. And in the interview with Quinlan, he makes the point that since the people who were building GFS were actually the same people who were building the system on top of GFS that were consuming it, that they were able to sort of be very fluid in terms of defining what the requirements were for this system. Um, and I think that's kind of, it's an interesting thing to think about in terms of you know, how, how you know, we build systems in the future, right? That sometimes just these sort of like little political disagreements between you know, groups at different layers in the system can really uh, stymie uh, advances like this. So you know, the system that they ended up with was uh, uh, referred to as the Google file system. And uh, this is sort of a high level overview of, uh, of how it works. So um, when a file is written to GFS, it's basically split up into a, a number of fixed size chunks. So in the original uh, GFS implementation, these chunks were 64 megabytes in size, uh, which is a lot larger um, than the blocks that you find in a traditional file system. But it makes sense in the context of storing files that you know, on average are going to be gigabytes, if not potentially even terabytes in size. Um, and the advantage, of course, of having big blocks, uh, or at least one really significant advantage, is 
that it reduces the metadata load on whatever system you're using to store the file system metadata. There's less of it to store since the number of objects that it needs to track uh, and, and keep track of are, are uh, limited in number. So another sort of significant uh, uh, design element here is that once that file is split up into chunks, uh, those chunks are then parceled out more or less randomly to a set of chunk servers. And three copies, or whatever the replication factor for the file system are, you know, by default three, three copies would then be distributed uh, across the uh, chunk servers in the system. Um, so there are, this, you know, in one sense this is very different from uh, the way that sort of traditional distributed file systems achieve reliability by using something like RAID or a parity-based striping mechanism, uh, which is more efficient in terms of uh, the amount of disk space that's used. I mean, you're able to, let's say, if you use uh, you know, RAID 5, you're basically uh, you know, trading off like a fifth of your storage space for that additional reliability. Um, so this is a lot less efficient in terms of disk space, but because they're actually creating multiple copies of every chunk, they do get some other benefits in return. So one of them is that uh, the load can be distributed very evenly uh, across these chunk servers when the same file is being read by multiple clients. So uh, basically a coordinator has the option of, um, of saying, you know, uh, if these three clients are reading the same file, they don't necessarily have to all talk to the same chunk server. Another advantage of this is that, uh, you know, in the system that, that they devised, they expected uh, not just to have disk failures, but they also expected to have chunk server failures. They expected the whole node to just disappear and go down. Uh, and at that point, if you're basically building chunk servers on top of RAID, uh, the RAID wouldn't matter, right? Because you lose uh, the chunk server as, as an entire unit. So this way, when a chunk server goes down, you have two other chunk servers available where you can read the same block from. Um, and finally, the other nice sort of characteristic of this is that when a chunk server goes down, since the uh, uh, other, uh, since all, you know, basically like all of the blocks that are on that one chunk server have replicas distributed in a more or less uniform fashion over the remaining chunk servers, the load uh, that's required uh, in a, you know, to sort of read those chunks back and uh, copy them to a new chunk server in order to maintain the replication factor is then distributed evenly across uh, the other servers in the pool. So earlier I mentioned that uh, you know, the, the problem that Google was sort of contending with uh, was twofold. They were worried about the cost um, of the sort of traditional NAS and SAN solution, uh, and they were also worried about scalability. So I think, you know, in, if you look at just the stuff that's described in the original GFS paper, and you hold it against these, these goals, um, based on what they articulated in that paper, it's pretty clear that they solved the cost problem. I mean, they articulated a way of building a very scalable uh, file system using commodity components. But I don't think that if you look at just the GFS paper that they really solve the scalability problem. Because fundamentally it's still a client server type of file system where the clients are all going to pull data across the network and that, that network is then going to become the IO bottleneck. Um, and it wasn't until a year later when they published the MapReduce paper that the missing puzzle piece appeared. And it was in the MapReduce paper where they said, no, actually, here's how GFS works. This is not a conventional file system where you have clients that are pulling data over to the client in order to do work on the data there. Instead, we are going to take the work and push it over to the data. So MapReduce is basically a distributed computing framework that allows you to send work over to the nodes where the data actually exists. And by uh, you know, sort of maintaining data locality, you almost completely eliminate this network bottleneck problem. You know, MapReduce uh, does require some uh, network traffic between nodes. It has you know, a shuffle and sort phase and stuff like that. But uh, it, at least at a first order, you've basically eliminated this, this you know, really significant bottleneck. Um, and that, you know, I think, is the, is the key benefit um, of Hadoop and of HDFS. And it's, I think, you know, really interesting that if you just look at the GFS paper, that this missing piece is not mentioned anywhere there. But if you go back and you read that paper, you can tell that that's what they're thinking. It's kind of sort of an interesting historical thing. So, um, you know, these papers were published in 2003 and 2004. 
And at around that same time, um, Doug Cutting and Mike Caffarello were working on an open source project called Nutch, which was an outgrowth of Apache Lucene. And their goal was to build an open source uh, search engine. So they saw these papers, and they realized immediately, hey, this is clearly the way uh, that you know, we have to build Nutch. We need to uh, build a distributed file system equivalent to GFS, and we need to devise our own MapReduce implementation. And that's what uh, became Hadoop. So Hadoop is you know, these two things, HDFS, which is uh, you know, Hadoop's version of GFS, and then their own uh, MapReduce um, implementation. So that uh, you know, project came into existence in 2005. Uh, it was um, initially uh, used uh, quite heavily at Yahoo and then Facebook. Um, and in the last, I would say, three to four years, we've seen sort of more general adoption um, within enterprise data centers. So uh, you know, my, my previous employer, Cloudera, has sort of built a business around um, helping companies that are, uh, you know, let's say, already using Oracle or already using SQL Server or something like that uh, to figure out ways of sort of transitioning to uh, this lower cost and more scalable infrastructure. Um, but the fact that uh, you know, people are actually using this in industry has given us an opportunity to get a sense for uh, you know, what are the practical benefits of Hadoop and also what are the drawbacks. So in terms of benefits, um, I think you know, at the very top of the list is the way that HDFS uh, has commoditized uh, enterprise storage. And this has had really significant uh, effects on, in terms of what uh, enterprise organizations are uh, doing with their data and also the amount of data that they're actually retaining on site. Um, so you know, in the past, and actually still today, you find that most uh, large organizations uh, have some data that they maintain in an online fashion in their data center, but a lot of the data that they collect is getting written to tape and put on a truck, and the truck drives to a cave somewhere, and it's deposited there, and no one ever looks at it again. Uh, and you know, some of you guys might think I'm joking about the cave thing, but you should look up Iron Mountain, which is one of these companies. They literally have a cave. Uh, so, so that's that's I mean one major thing. Like companies that were formerly uh, putting a lot of data on tape, never to be seen again, are now maintaining it in HDFS instead. And they're able to derive a lot of benefit from that data. Another big advantage is uh, the way that, that HDFS allows uh, companies to scale out um, in, a, in a genuinely fashion instead of having to invest uh, in more expensive hardware to scale up. Um, it also uh, uh, gives them uh, the ability to, to run a system in a fault tolerant manner, I think in, in a manner that wasn't really available before with other sort of existing NAS and SAN solutions. And it's also introduced a new level of flexibility in terms of uh, the data um, that these organizations can operate on. So uh, you know, one, of the, one of the things about Hadoop is that it is, uh, or HDFS in particular, it's sort of a you know, write once, read many times file system. It's sort of like an online archive file system. So um, the ability to operate on data in place in the format in which it lands on disk uh, is very attractive. Uh, and Hadoop um, offers uh, you know, flexible tools that allow you basically to extract information from a variety of different uh, formats. So, uh, whoops. So at the same time, uh, I think you know, people are aware that Hadoop has a bunch of drawbacks. And uh, chief among these is MapReduce itself. Um, you know, MapReduce uh, is very powerful in the sense that it's extremely flexible. But a lot of that flexibility comes from the fact that it's so generic or so general and also so low level. Um, so to do even sort of simple operations, you're going to end up writing pages of Java code. Uh, and once you've written this code, it's more or less impossible to maintain. I mean, you're going to have trouble remembering a month later what the, what the code you wrote does. Uh, and your uh, ability to share it with a coworker is you know, close to zero. Um, so part of this relates to the fact that MapReduce doesn't have any schemas. Uh, and schemas are, are really valuable. I think many times when people think about schemas in the context of like uh, you know, a relational database, they maybe think that in some ways schemas are the enemy, right? Because uh, oftentimes, you'll find that before, you know, maybe you have some data that you really want to analyze in the database. But before you can even get it into the database, you have to talk to your DBA. And your DBA is going to spend a couple of days trying to figure out the right schema uh, you know, for this data. So there's a lot of latency, a lot of 
um, sort of organizational latency uh, built into this. And, and the reason for that is that if you get the schema wrong, that's an expensive mistake to make. So um, you know, schemas in, in sort of the traditional context are a high stakes game, uh, but they also provide a lot of value because they allow you to uh, view data in a logical fashion as opposed to having to worry about the underlying physical structure of it. And Hadoop, without schemas, forces you to constantly worry about the underlying physical structure. And then the other missing features, uh, I think, can quickly be summarized by saying that people really want Hadoop to look more like a database. Um, they want Hadoop, uh, they, you know, they like the scalability, they like um, the flexibility, but at the same time, uh, databases look the way they do for a reason. They've evolved over the past 20 or 30 years in response to the needs of users, and they provide a bunch of features uh, that make a lot of sense when what you're trying to do is analyze data. Um, so these include uh, you know, things that help you write code or help you write better code, like optimizers and indexes and views. Uh, and there's also this uh, large ecosystem of tools that run on top of databases uh, that know how to speak things like ODBC and JDBC, uh, and which allow you to do really interesting things with your data, like business intelligence tools, uh, ETL tools for transforming and manipulating your data, and then uh, uh, things like SQL IDEs or, or other environments for, for doing data analysis. So the way that uh, the Hadoop community responded to these shortcomings of the sort of core platform was by building a variety of domain-specific languages on top of Hadoop. So the idea was you no longer have to code your job in MapReduce. Instead, you can use this other language, which we compile down to MapReduce. Um, so there were a variety of languages that, that, that evolved like this. Uh, Google, of course, has something called Sawzall, which they published a paper on. They also have uh, a SQL uh, DSL, DSL referred to as Tensing. Um, within the Hadoop world, we have things like Pig. Uh, we also have uh, Cascading, which is kind of like a Java data flow uh, API. Um, the the uh, layer, though, or the, the DSL that I think has gained the most uh, interest and adoption within sort of the enterprise software community is Hive. Um, so Hive you know, made the very pragmatic decision. Uh, instead of inventing our own language, we're going to stick with SQL. Um, because, you know, SQL has some uh, rough edges, it has some bugs, but at least we've learned what those bugs are over the last 30 years, and they're easy to work around. And also, it turns out the entire world basically speaks SQL, including all of those ecosystem tools that I mentioned earlier. So it's sort of like, as soon as, you know, SQL is like the Esperanto of data processing, except that people actually speak it, unlike Esperanto. <laughs> uh, so, so anyway, that's, that's the situation we're in. Uh, so one thing about Hive that I really want to, want to sort of like try to convey is that most people, when you mention it, they think, OK, Hive is like a SQL to MapReduce uh, compilation and execution engine, which is very true. That's what it is. But it's also these two other things uh, that I don't think it gets enough credit uh, for being. Um, so one of those things, basically, is uh, the data model that it provides. And by data model, I mean the way that it uh, basically allows you to map logical structure in the form of schemas to underlying physical data that can be in basically any format you want. So in order to provide that functionality, Hive has two components. One is the Hive Metastore, which basically allows you, it's, it's, you can think of it as Hive's um, uh, uh, table catalog. So the Metastore maintains mappings uh, of the form table basically to uh, underlying file in HDFS, or to, to HDFS location where the data is stored. And it also maintains mappings of table to SERDI name, where uh, SERDIs are basically um, these plug-in libraries that allow you to handle different formats. So with these two bits of information, uh, when Hive um, executes uh, a query plan, which is in the form of basically a graph of MapReduce jobs, each one of these MapReduce jobs gets sent to a data node, uh, which you could think of as uh, HDFS's version of chunk servers in GFS. Um, and the, uh, the MapReduce job, which is expressed in terms of Hive operators, is, is executed there. But the data, as it's read off of HDFS, is filtered through one of these SERDIs. So an example would be, let's say, a CSV SERDI, or a JSON SERDI, or um, perhaps uh, an RC file SERDI, which is uh, Hive's uh, columnar format. Um, but in this way, 
it allows you to do something really cool, which uh, uh, I think people have started to refer to as schema on read as opposed to schema on write. So this is sort of you know the the really I think the really cool benefit of Hive and the thing that I expect um, will sort of be Hive's lasting impact on uh, you know the the database world, not you know SQL to MapReduce, but this very like flexible way of mapping logical structure onto underlying physical data. Yep. So basically, a SERTI, uh, and by the way, SERTI stands for serialized, deserialized. So, sorry? SERTI, S E R D E F. So, when you are deserializing, you are basically reading from a file, and what you are pulling out of it are rows split into columns with types. Okay? And in the reverse direction, you feed in basically these structures that are typed uh, columns and then it writes it out to the underlying file. So you were saying, could you have a SERTI that goes from CSV to, uh, let's say, JSON or something like that? You wouldn't, you'd actually use two SERTIs for that process. You would use a JSON SERTI and a CSV SERTI, and what you would do would be to construct two tables, one of which is based on top of JSON, the other on top of CSV. And then um, one interesting thing about Hive is that it's added a variety of sort of extensions to base SQL, including semantics that allow you to easily do things like stream data from one table into another table. So I, I hope that answers your question. So, um, you know, I think Hive uh, solved a bunch of problems, but in many ways it's also been sort of a victim of its own success because uh, as soon as you start making something look like a database, people are like, hey, this is great. I like that it looks like a database, but I wish you would cover that remaining 50% and make it look completely like a database. You know, where are uh, you know, this missing uh, SQL feature that I'm used to using. Where uh, is the authentication and authorization system? Um, here's a data type that I expected you to support as part of the SQL standard, but I don't see it here. Um, and then another problem with Hive from the standpoint of many users uh, is caused by the fact uh, that it's basically delegating execution to MapReduce. So MapReduce is a very powerful tool, but it makes some compromises uh, which are probably not the best compromises to make in the context of, of a database engine um, like Hive. And the, the big compromise that it makes is that it's batch oriented. So it guarantees basically really high throughput, um, but uh, it has this sort of built in latency uh, as a result of the fact that you know, when you start a job, you have to talk to the job tracker, and the job tracker has to go and parcel out jobs to. Um, each one of the uh, data nodes, so that uh, as a result, even if you are running a query against just a small sliver of data, let's say a megabyte or 100 megabytes or something like that, uh, the, the minimum sort of turnaround time on that query is going to be 15 to 30 seconds. And if you ran the same query, uh, let's say, on PostgreSQL on a single node, you'd expect it to complete you know, in under a second. So. Um, with Hive, this sort of like whole sort of uh, uh, way of interacting with the database where you do sort of very small exploratory queries to try to gain like an understanding of you know, the layout of your data and what's actually there, it's not really feasible or practical with Hive. So um, in the past year to maybe two years, uh, I think it's fair to say a sort of new generation of distributed analytic databases has emerged um, which are you know, largely being designed to sort of solve this set of problems. And in particular, the problem of uh, the latency overhead and inefficiencies that are introduced by using MapReduce. Um, so examples of these uh, systems would uh, include things like Impala from Cloudera, uh, the uh, Apache Drill project. Um, Google's uh, Dremel is, is an example of this, also within uh, Google. Uh, and CitusDB uh, is another example of that. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about CitusDB, but, but before I do, I wanted to show uh, sort of the, the common like, architectural difference that sets these uh, new databases apart from, let's say, the previous generation of MPP databases uh, that emerged over the previous decade. So this 
uh, looks a lot like um, you know, what, what we've seen recently where people have been adapting MPP databases to run on top of Hadoop. Um, and what they're effectively doing is creating a connector between the uh, worker nodes in the MPP cluster and the data nodes in HDFS. And the problem with this approach is that you have the, the I.O. bottleneck uh, between these two layers. So you're not achieving uh, data locality for your jobs, and a system like this is just not going to scale. Um, but the solution you know, is, at least if you know, we want to illustrate it graphically, it's pretty straightforward. You get rid of uh, the dedicated MPP data nodes, and you take the processes, the worker processes that were running on those nodes, and you co-locate them on each one of the data nodes. So in effect, what you're doing then is pushing uh, the work down to the data as opposed to um, pulling the work, uh, or sorry, pulling the data over to the work. Um, and this you know, allows systems like this to scale out uh, in the same way that uh, you're able to scale out with something like MapReduce. So uh, I wanted to go into some more detail about uh, how this uh, actually plays out in a system like CytusDB. So uh, CytusDB is built on top of PostgreSQL. Uh, and if we look at the, the components uh, in the system, on the left-hand side, we have uh, PostgreSQL clients, uh, ODBC and JDBC driver. And I think this is you know, one of the really significant points I wanted to make that as far as a client is concerned, as far as a user is concerned, CytusDB looks almost identical to PostgreSQL. So uh, you can basically continue to use PSQL or the different uh, you know, tools that you're familiar with. The, the uh, support for SQL is you know, virtually the same. Um, all of the same you know, system tables are there and stuff like that. Um, but in terms of changes we've made, uh, on the master node, um, once again, it's more or less stock PostgreSQL with the addition of our distributed uh, query uh, compiler and execution engine. Um, and then on each one of the uh, HDFS data nodes, um, we co-locate uh, what is, in effect, a stock uh, copy of PostgreSQL, um, along with uh, a foreign data wrapper that we've written that allows us to basically uh, read from HDFS. Um, so. I wanted to go into a little bit more detail about how uh, this actually works by um, giving an example of, of how a query is executed. So uh, to start off, when you create uh, a table uh, on the CytusDB master, um, you would basically specify uh, a directory or a file in HDFS that that uh, logical table name needs to map to. And then as part of a prior offline step, the master node syncs file system metadata off of the HDFS name node. So this basically allows it to map, it allows the master node to map um, an HDFS file name to a set of blocks and data nodes uh, in the underlying storage pool. And then, uh, as once the table is created and once the metadata has been synced, the master node talks to each one of the worker nodes and it creates a foreign table per block on each one of the data nodes uh, using uh, the HDFS foreign data wrapper. So then subsequently, let's say the user uh, submits a query, a simple uh, aggregation query um, you know, to find the average salary of managers you know, in the organization. So as a first step, uh, we take that global query and we rewrite it uh, as a set of um, as a set of uh, queries or fragment queries that can be executed on the worker nodes. Um, and those queries then, or there's effectively one query per foreign table where each foreign table maps to a block on each one of those data nodes. The worker nodes uh, execute those fragment queries, uh, generate partial result sets, which are then returned to uh, the master <laughs> node, which merges those results together and returns uh, a final answer to um, the client. So there are some sort of interesting details uh, that I wanted to, to, to cover uh, at a slightly lower level. So um, one of them uh, has to do with block awareness. So you know, I had that, that previous slide where I showed that you know, in a sense what we're doing is taking a traditional MPP database architecture. And the, the most significant change we're making is that we're co-locating the worker processes on the data nodes. 
but I don't want to leave you with the impression that that's all you have to do uh, in order to um, achieve data locality. Because the problem is that if, that's, if that alone is what you do, uh, those MPP worker processes running on the data nodes are still going to have to basically fetch data from all of their neighbors in order to satisfy any query. So it's very important that the master node, when it is scheduling a query, when it is scheduling those fragment queries, that it sends them to the correct data nodes so that those data nodes can do those reads locally. And that's what we refer to as block awareness. Um, so you know, another uh, thing that's worth uh, mentioning is fault tolerance. Um, so our solution to fault tolerance, uh, I, I think, can quickly be summarized by saying that we're basically leveraging uh, the best features of the two platforms that we're building on top of, Hadoop and PostgreSQL. So what happens if the master node fails? Well, we take advantage of PostgreSQL streaming replication to make sure that the table metadata uh, is copied over to um, a hot standby. And that uh, you know, solves the problem at the master node level. And at the worker nodes, since we are actually delegating the storage problem um, as well as the fault tolerance problem to HDFS, uh, if one of those nodes uh, fails, um, we already know that the, the actual data has been replicated uh, to a bunch of neighbors uh, and can quickly fail over to them. Um, and uh, the, the sort of missing piece, the piece that we actually had to implement on, on our own, is the ability to, uh, if a process or if a query is in the process of executing, detect that a node which is responsible for some of these fragment queries has gone down and to reassign those queries dynamically uh, to other replicas in the system. So, you know, one of the, uh, the things that I think, um, yep. It's the last of the replicas. Then you're screwed, basically. Yeah. Uh, you would get an error back. That's true. Um, and you would get an error back quickly because it would determine that it can't talk or it can't communicate with any of the, uh, you know, the three uh, uh, replicas in that situation. So I mean, there there is a limit to like, you know. Yeah. No. No. Fair. Fair. Fair question. Fair question. Um, so you know, back when, uh, back when. Uh, I was, you know, first talking to the guys at Citus Data, um, you know, about uh, joining the company. Um, they were talking about what they had done with uh, with Citus uh, DB and how they had built it on top of PostgreSQL. I wasn't very familiar with PostgreSQL at the time. Uh, my main, uh, you know, I was mainly familiar with things like MySQL and, in particular, with things like Hive. Uh, and as they were telling me about some of the different uh, features of PostgreSQL that they were leveraging, they mentioned foreign data wrappers. And I got really excited about this because foreign data wrappers, uh, you know, I quickly realized are uh, really a much more powerful version of Hive Certies. Um, and you know, using foreign data wrappers, uh, we are able to achieve the same sort of like novel benefits uh, that separate Hive from sort of traditional databases. The ability to do schema on read as opposed to schema on write, which introduces this whole new level of flexibility. Uh, and you know, very significantly, schema on write is more, or schema on read is more than about just flexibility. It's also, in a sense, about performance. Because if you can read data in place, regardless of the format, without first having to go through this process of loading it, in other words, translating it or converting it into the native format of the database before you can read it, uh, that's a significant um, you know, performance win in terms of overall latency. And just as, as a quick side note, there a couple of weeks ago or maybe a month ago, someone posted uh, a performance comparison between Hive uh, and Amazon Redshift, and this was you know carried on Hacker News. And the sort of like high level uh, thing was, oh, you know, Redshift like does this query in 30 seconds, and it takes Hive um, you know 10 minutes or something like that. But what they left out was that it had taken 17 hours for them to load the data into Redshift before they could query it. So. You know, it's very it's very important to consider both I think time to query as well as time of query uh, when you're talking about these problems. Um, so another significant thing about 
foreign data wrappers is that since it's a public API, uh, it means that um, we can use this as an extension point and continue to build on it without having to worry about forking the code. I mean, without foreign data wrappers, we could have defined this API on our own, but it would have been uh, you know, a very brittle thing uh, to have to maintain. And I think more often than not, what you see, uh, definitely you've seen this happen in the past with other uh, companies that have built distributed databases on top of Postgres. They end up basically forking pretty early on. One of our design goals from uh, the very beginning uh, has been to structure Citus DB in such a way that it's decoupled enough from Postgres SQL that with each new version of Postgres SQL, we can, let's say, in a matter of weeks, rebase the changes that we've made onto the new version uh, and then uh, deliver to our customers both you know, the, the value that we've added as well as the, the new features that the community has provided. And that's something that we're really excited about. Yes? Uh, you know, that's probably uh, a better question for my coworker Samid to answer. So let me just say that I love foreign data wrappers. I think that they are <laughs> like the, the coolest thing ever. But if there's one thing I don't like about foreign data wrappers, it's the name. Um, because I think that it seriously undersells the power of this API. And in particular, when you're trying to talk to a customer or an analyst and you use the word foreign data wrapper, and you're like, yeah, this stuff is awesome. We're using foreign data wrappers. It allows us to do all these cool things. I mean, they hear two words like, uh, uh, foreign and wrapper, which in this context don't necessarily sound that good, especially when you're talking about data locality and then you say foreign, they think, oh, you know, you're obviously like pulling data over the network, and, and wrapper just sounds like some, you know, lightweight piece of cruff. Yes? SQL med, yeah, would be a, a good option. Um, but then the problem with SQL med is you have to say, like, oh, yeah, but that's like a 10 or 15 year old standard, and then that sounds uh, boring, right? I mean, you want you want stuff to be new, and you want it to have this cool buzzword attached to it. And unfortunately, anyway, we should have, form a focus group, and we'll we'll work on this. Uh, it's a good idea. So what I've started saying is that that really foreign data wrappers um, are uh, pluggable storage engines. It is an API for pluggable storage engines, and that that's to me is what it looks a lot like, and it's what it allows you to do. Um, and one of the ways, in fact, in which foreign data wrappers are more powerful than Hive Surties is that they allow you to do filter pushdown. And once you have the ability to do filter pushdown, um, it becomes uh, very practical to build a foreign data wrapper on top of a columnar format. So out of curiosity, by you know, hands, how many people are familiar with like columnar data formats? OK, cool. So some people, but uh, not enough that I shouldn't explain what I'm talking about. So um, traditional databases, when they lay data out on disk, they use a row major format, which means that if you're doing a table scan, you basically read row one, then row two, then row three, et cetera, et cetera. In a column major format, uh, data is laid out like column one, column two, column three, or perhaps a chunk of column one, a chunk of column two, et cetera, and then the next chunk of column one, column two. So there are these sort of like hybrid formats like RC file or PACS where Things, things are chunked like that. The advantage of columnar formats, especially uh, for um, OLAP databases, where most queries are going to end up triggering full table scans, is that if you have a predicate um, that, uh, well, let's be even more basic. Let's say that you're only looking at one of the columns uh, in your query, as opposed to doing a select star. You don't actually want to read 
uh, those other columns off disk. I mean, we know that uh, I.O. is pr pretty much like the biggest bottleneck. So if you can do a seek over just a large expanse of data on disk instead of doing a read, as you would have to do with a column major format, that is like the single biggest performance benefit you can get right, right there. Um, another cool thing about columnar formats um, is uh, the impact they have on compression. So people have known for uh, a while now that if you have an I.O. bound task, uh, one way of uh, improving the performance is actually to compress your data. And the, this is sort of a little bit counterintuitive because you think, oh, well, uh, you know, if I'm using compressed data, I have to devote uh, CPU resources to doing the compression and decompression. But it turns out uh, that the amount of time it takes to do that is much less than the amount of time that you save in terms of doing the I.O. to transfer the compressed data uh, from disk uh, into cache. Um, and columnar formats make this even better because it turns out that most of the compression algorithms that people use uh, will actually uh, you know, generate higher compression ratios if the stuff that you're trying to compress is like similar. So in other words, let's say that you have uh, a string column, an int column, a string column, an int column. Uh, if you have to compress that data in a row major format, uh, the compression ratio will not be as good as if you were, the other case, were using a columnar format where you could compress an entire int column followed by an entire string column. Um, so, you know, this is like, uh, you know, one of the reasons why we're really, uh, we're really big on foreign data wrappers. Uh, for us, uh, the ability to be able to, like, plug in multiple different uh, columnar formats uh, seems like a huge win, especially in the context of Hadoop, since right now there are several different competing uh, columnar file format standards. Um, and it's nice to actually have the option of supporting uh, multiple formats as opposed to just one. Um, so, and then this is the, my final thought about foreign data wrappers. Um, so someone in the audience mentioned SQL uh, MED earlier, which was the original, like, ANSI SQL standard that sort of uh, outlined this idea of um, adding this sort of like standard for creating a level of indirection between the, the tables that you see in one database and actually having them redirect to data that's stored somewhere else. And the use case that people were thinking about 10 or 15 years ago or whenever it was when they came up with this standard was really database federation. And the problem that they were trying to solve was that you know, enterprise organizations don't have one database. They probably have 10 or 100 databases. And uh, that creates a big management problem, especially when uh, you, know, you really want to be able to have sort of a unified view of all of your data. So if you're able to create tables that behind the scenes actually redirect to data that's managed by another table, that's a huge sort of management win. Um, but what uh, SQL MED, uh, you know, at the time, I don't think anyone was really thinking about was uh, what this would look like in more of a distributed systems context. Um, and so, you know, let's think about it this way. Like, let's suppose that you have a single PostgreSQL instance and you have a um, MongoDB uh, foreign data wrapper. Um, you are able, from your single uh, PostgreSQL instance, to push a filter down to MongoD, but uh, anything that, that results from that sort of like query then has to be pulled back across the network so that on your single node, let's say you can do the rest of the aggregation that you, you wanted to do or something like that. Now, if you have a distributed version of PostgreSQL, you can actually co-locate the PostgreSQL worker processes on the nodes that are used by your distributed block store, let's say MongoDB, HBase or, for example, HDFS. And then uh, you can both push the filter down uh, into, let's say, MongoDB. But once you pull the results back up, instead of sending them over the network, you can apply uh, part of the aggregation uh, in a data local, local fashion. So the amount of uh, I.O. that has to be done over the network uh, is significantly uh, reduced. So uh, you know, the, the point I'm trying to make, I guess, is that like, there's federation, and then there's distributed federation. And distributed federation is a pretty cool idea. Yes? So OK, so we don't support inserts or updates in CitusDB. And that's part of being like an OLAP database. 
Um, in terms of uh, supporting uh, you know, transaction-oriented things in the underlying block stores, for example, MongoDB, uh, I think, I don't know, what, what would you say? Um, actually, could we just save the questions for the end, just so I can get through the, I have like two more slides, and then we'll break for questions. Uh, okay, one more point. So, uh, you know, one of the other reasons why we decided to build CitusDB on top of Postgres SQL, I mean, there, there, are, there are a couple of reasons, right? Like, why reinvent the wheel when you can um, build on top of something that's already great? Uh, another reason being that, uh, you know, building a distributed database is more than just building uh, a distributed query compiler and execution engine. It's also like all of these tools uh, that sit around it. And uh, you know, I've definitely learned that the hard way from working on Hive, you know, where you implement one thing and people are like, that's great, but what about these 10 other things that you haven't yet finished? Uh, and, um, but, but I think an, another uh, thing that you know, we've been really excited about is the fact that you have these, these two communities um, which are both very vibrant, which are doing great work, uh, and we really see CitusDB as a way of uh, sort of combining those two communities into one, or at least providing people uh, on either side with access to uh, the great tools that are produced by the other. So for people uh, who are you know, already part of the Hadoop community, here's a chance uh, to use an enterprise class database and an enterprise class feature set on top of Hadoop uh, while uh, maintaining you know, the, the sort of like characteristics of Hadoop in terms of scalability uh, and cost effectiveness. And for um, Postgres SQL users, you know, here's a chance to use the tools that you're already familiar with, um, but to use them uh, you know, on top of a, a platform uh, that allows you to uh, analyze you know, petabytes of data. Uh, and also, you know, in addition to that, we've sort of introduced this, I think, new level of flexibility with schema on read uh, and features like that. Um, so I just wanted to you know, quickly sort of uh, you know, give some closing thoughts. So I think you know, the first one is that uh, it's a little bit unfortunate that uh, we have this, this name Hadoop, which lumps together MapReduce and HDFS. Because I think, as a result, people think that like, these two components are inextricably linked together and that they're of equal value. And I mean, this is my opinion, but uh, HDFS is much, much, much more valuable than MapReduce. MapReduce is not the only way to distribute computation uh, across the, the data nodes in your cluster. Uh, I mean, CitusDB is one example of another way, right? Instead of using MapReduce, we have our own custom operator there. Uh, and and you know, we, we get a, a more efficient system, a more uh, expressive system as a result. Um, but I think the other thing is that, that HDFS is really what is sort of driving industry adoption of Hadoop. Um, because of the way that it commoditizes storage, it you know, effectively sort of frees you from the, the clutches of the NAS and SAN mafia. Uh, and um, also, I mean, it's really changing the way that organizations uh, manage data. I mean, the fact that it's so inexpensive compared to NAS and SAN technology means that this data that you were previously just writing to tape and effectively chucking, you're now keeping on site. Uh, and once you have it on site, of course, well, if we have it, why not query it? Why not try to extract uh, some information from it? Um, and that, you know, in turn, is sort of uh, driving uh, this work to try to figure out how we can um, build, uh, you know, databases that look familiar, that provide this familiar feature set on top of this new storage layer. And this storage layer is significantly different from the storage layer that, that already exists in the enterprise. And it's these differences that sort of uh, require us to devise this new architecture. So it may seem like a little strong to say that like this is a new generation of analytic databases, but I do think, I genuinely think that they are significantly different from the databases that you know, evolved over the previous decade. And I, I think that that um, you know, description is warranted. So the, the other sort of closing thought um, just has to do with you know, a summary of sort of the core benefits of um, SQL on Hadoop uh, 
uh, and, and more, it, you know, more specifically Postgres SQL on Hadoop. Um, so, you know, in terms of sort of new features, things that weren't possible before, we have this nice ability to sort of decouple the logical schema from the underlying physical data. So you don't have to do loads. Uh, so you don't have to wait for your DBA to model your data before you can analyze it. So it, it has both, um, I think, an impact on the way that you interact with your coworkers and, and your ability to like quickly uh, uh, you know, run queries against things. It also has a very significant impact on the way that you utilize your underlying storage. Uh, if you have to load data into a database, you're not just transforming it, you're also copying it. So you end up with multiple copies of the same data in multiple different storage systems across um, your data center. Doing schema on read means that you have one copy, and you can even have the, uh, you know, you can even project multiple different logical views onto that uh, data as, as sort of an additional level of flexibility. Um, another core benefit is that since we're building on top of a uh, horizontally scalable file system um, and, and leveraging, uh, you know, the sort of key principle that makes it scalable data locality, we're able to uh, maintain those same characteristics. Uh, the same goes for fault tolerance. Um, and then I think the, the key thing uh, that uh, sort of differentiates uh, this new generation of uh, uh, distributed databases from Hive is that by replacing MapReduce, we're able to achieve low latency, which means that you are now able to do interactive queries against small slices of data. And that, you know, once again, really changes the way um, that you, you, know, you can interact with your data. We're hiring. Um, we really like PostgreSQL. We hack on PostgreSQL a lot. Uh, it seems like this is a pretty good audience, you know, for doing recruiting. Um, so uh, if any of you folks are interested uh, in perhaps getting a job or changing jobs, uh, you should definitely talk to us. Um, that's uh, a link for our website. Uh, we also have a bunch of interesting blog posts uh, and also um, Another cool thing is uh, you can actually download a copy of SiteSDB, uh, install it on your machine, and take it out for a test drive. We have uh, EC2 images available, um, as well as, uh, I think, what, CentOS and RHEL uh, RPMs. Um, OK, questions? Yes? Uh, what's the license? The license. Uh, Sameed, actually. I'm going to. So parts of it are open source and parts of it are not open source. Uh, so all of the foreign data wrappers that we've written are open source. Uh, the code that we use for syncing metadata off of the Hadoop name node is open source. The parts that are closed source right now um, are basically the distributed query planner uh, that we wrote. Um, and uh, I don't think that we, uh, you know, speaking for my coworkers, I don't think we have any sort of like inherent objection to at some point in the future possibly open sourcing this. It's more of just a, like, you know, we can't do that right now, right? Um, that's how I'd explain that. Yes? There's a certain threshold of data uh, amounts and stuff where we're kind of moving away from just doing a Postgres querying versus doing this sort of kind of additional legwork of a, Right. So I, I would say, like, uh, if you're getting close to, like, let's say, 10 terabytes of data, that's probably uh, where this becomes, you know, a practical solution. Um, most, most cases, like, I think we have two different types of customers. So one customer uh, uh, sort of, like, archetype are people who already have uh, a Hadoop cluster set up. Um, and they're using Hive, but they're like, man, I can't stand the latency, or uh, I really wish it you know, provided better support for SQL, or I already used Postgres SQL, and now I'm using Hadoop, and I really wish I could run you know, one on top of the other. Uh, then we have um, other customers who um, are you know, doing things at, let's say, like terabyte scale, right? So they have, they're running Postgres SQL, but it's starting to sort of slow down a little bit and hiccup, and they know that they need to go for a distributed solution but they're not necessarily interested in setting up their own Hadoop cluster because that adds this additional 
uh, management layer. I didn't mention it in the presentation, but Citus DB actually has two different deployment modes. So in one mode, you deploy it on top of Hadoop, and HDFS basically manages the storage. Uh, in the other deployment model, uh, every worker node basically runs PostgreSQL, but it runs on top of the native file system, like ext3 or ext2, in which case it just uses PostgreSQL's uh, storage engine um, for managing the, the, uh, the table shards, basically. And, and then would you be using Postgres foreign data wrappers? Uh, we would uh, not actually use Postgres uh, foreign data wrappers. We would actually create basically like uh, fragment tables. Uh, on each one of the uh, on each one of the workers, using a basically like the size of these fragment tables is configured, and then when the user loads data uh, into this sort of like distributed Postgres database, um, we sort of in parallel then stream data into these different fragment tables on the worker nodes. Uh, yes. Uh, no, it, it allows. So, how, I, how, how can we uh, configure on the other book to, to have a good deal? Push queries? Push queries to different Right. So, it's, it's basically up to the implementer of the foreign data wrapper uh, to, to support things like that. So, uh, you know, you have the ability right now to, um, uh, let's say, extract. Uh, filter conditions, which are something that are, are easy to push down, but you have to re-express that in terms of the API of the thing that you're talking to, in terms of the thing that you're building uh, the wrapper on top of. Change. Change the runtime. Uh, Okay. I'm not. I, let's take this question offline. Uh, I'm not sure how to answer it right now. Uh, question. Uh, so the question is, if you have a complex query, can you gather all of the data to one uh, local site? Uh, I'm not sure I understand why. What, what problem are you trying to solve by doing that? Or Okay, okay, sure. So, for example, the join, right? A join that references multiple tables. So there are different strategies uh, in distributed databases for doing joins. So one strategy that we support right now uh, is a broadcast join, where if you're joining a small table with a large table, uh, you can um, broadcast, basically, or copy the small table to each one of the worker nodes so that it has sort of a local copy. Uh, there are um, other strategies for doing um, big table joins in a distributed fashion uh, that we're working um, on implementing right now. Uh, but you know the the basic thing, the, the the basic issue, right, when doing a big table join is that you do have to transfer data uh, between the different worker nodes because you can't expect that uh, any given worker node will have all of the data locally stored that it needs in order to process like its fragment of the join. Um, and the, the algorithms that have evolved for handling this distributed join case basically try to uh, minimize the amount of data that, that you need to transfer. So there are different strategies. Uh, in our case, um, it's a little bit more complicated since um, we don't, we're not able to basically uh, assume anything about the underlying data in each block. Um, since uh, storage is completely delegated to HDFS, uh, we can't do some of the optimizations that you see uh, in other sort of more traditional MPP databases where they um, you know, pre-sort or they hash partition uh, the data across the nodes uh, you know, using a strategy like that. Um, 
Make sense? Okay. Question? Yeah, so uh, you basically use uh, our version of the copy command. So like I mentioned earlier, there are two different modes for, for operating uh, Citus DBN. So if you're in mode one, um, where you're actually using uh, Postgres SQL's storage layer instead of using Hadoop, um, then you would use our distributed copy command. And you would basically say, here's uh, the file, and I want you to copy it into the following table. And it would then, um, in a distributed fashion, basically stream that data uh, into each one of the worker nodes. Um, but you know, in, in the typical sort of like OLAP uh, use case scenario, the data that you want to process is like fact data or it is uh, log data. So it's not stuff that you're actually going to manipulate. You basically want to do joins or aggregations uh, or analytic SQL queries on, the, on that information. Um, and then in the case of uh, uh, you know, deployment mode two, where it's running on top of HDFS, uh, you would use um, the Hadoop tools for basically loading data in. So Hadoop has something called distcp, which is a distributed uh, copy program, which is typically used there. Any other questions? Uh, yes? Right. I'm going to actually let Samid answer that because he's been working on this recently. For the Postgres version, we can't. For the Hadoop version, we can't. Yeah. Uh, any other questions in the back? Yes, question. So we're using that at the master node level in order to replicate the table metadata that the master node maintains. So this is basically information that maps uh, a global table name to all of the uh, foreign tables that exist on each one of the uh, worker nodes. So it's basically the table metadata, both at sort of the global master level as well as the map things from the global level to uh, the worker level. Which is what we want to do, because there's a single master or a single active master, but you could have with streaming replication multiple hot standbys. Okay? And we're not interested in replicating, uh, you know, in a sense, real data, because no real data exists on the master. It's all metadata about basically where uh, you know, the shard records are stored on each one of the worker nodes. <coughs> 
Any other questions? Okay. Thank you.